Thanks very much, Helen, and thank you, um, Joe, for organizing this, uh, the, the fourth uh, conference. Um, we're looking for, we look forward to it every year, and, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have a good exchange today. So um, I'm really pleased again to be here, and um, I just made it in time because I used Air Canada, um, but I, was, I took a chance and, and, and made it here in time. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Now, Joe asked me to make sure we start with, um, with, uh, with, some, uh, with a question. So um, I, uh, I, I thought I could start off with something that was, was quite simple that, that people could maybe really sort of bite into and, 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 and express themselves in this. So the following, this is an archaeological discovery, and the following are the remains of, uh, if I can switch the slides, of a politician, a bureaucrat, a farmer rep, or a lawyer. It's your vote. <laughs> As an ex-politician, I'm not sure how I was supposed to interpret that. Um, but anyways, I just thought we would start off with a little bit of fun, and it does allow us to make all the lawyer jokes we want. Um, so thanks again. Uh, I just wanted to describe a little bit in, in the time that I have of who we are. For those of you who don't know the innovative pharmaceutical industry, uh, we and our an association, we represent 50 companies. It is growing. More and more companies are joining our association because they want to be affiliated with the innovative um, agenda and they also, an interesting big change that I've seen over the eight years that I've run the association, they want to be associated with the code of industry um, practices, the code of ethics. Now there's some very exciting things that are happening in our industry, albeit, and I will talk about this a little bit later, the acquisitions and mergers and downsizing, but we are an industry that represents in Canada well over 15,000 employees. And these are the jobs that every jurisdiction is trying to get. These are high paying, highly skilled jobs. Our industry also um, invests $1.3 billion of research in this country. You are, you are seeing the industry become more and more of a healthcare partner in 2012 and beyond than we have been in the past. We've been pulled in to, to being more and more an integral part of the healthcare system. You'll see the Rx and D companies, for instance, engaging with various provinces and teaching institutions to do things that we're calling VDIs, Value Demonstrating Initiatives, in which we're working hand in hand with the government and with uh, academic in institutions to prove the value of our medications because more and more as you see the pressure on, on fiscal, the fiscal pressure on governments that you get very much very quickly into a cost strategy and we want to change the debate into a value strategy. A good example of it is with, with three of our com companies we are working in PEI for example on COPD and we've proven that first and foremost uh, uh, about half the folks or a third of the folks that were diagnosed with COPD didn't have it. Then we also proved we're working together with better information that we could reduce uh, hospital visits, uh, emergency ward visits by 50 percent and return visits by 30 percent, reducing overall the, the uh, hospital stays at least by one day per patient. Huge savings. That's the kind of industry um, that you're going to be seeing in the next bit. We are also of the one point three billion dollars we invest, 75 to 80 percent of it is in clinical trials. So with the clinical trials, we are directly involved with patients, with healthcare professionals, and with research centers. That is a huge amount of, of commitment and integration within the system. You probably heard um, in the last bit is that our pipelines are drying up, are getting more difficult. It, to, to one extent, that's somewhat true because a lot of the main disease areas have been discovered, or at least for initial discoveries. But as you can see here, what's in the works, what's in the pipelines, are huge numbers of very exciting molecules. Now within that, it's costing us well over 1.3 1, 1 .3 to 2 billion in some of the, the, the figures we've seen to bring a new molecule to market. It takes uh, one in 10,000 molecules to actually finally become a product, and only three of 10 of those um, actually make the profit to reinvest in research. Now, you've also seen a huge change, and you can see this in this, in this graph, is that biologics now represent 20% of all our medicines on the market, and they represent 50% of the medicines um, in development. 
So these medicines, of course, can mitigate and in some case eliminate disease, but they are expensive and we are going to have to get more focused on targeted medicines and targeted delivery so that we, along with um, the payers, whether it's private or public, can, can ensure that they have full value uh, for their dollars when it comes to engaging us. Now, in terms of our investment, and I don't know what this slide is doing here because um, it is completely wrong, this slide. <laughs> so we'll just let it stand here for a second, and I don't know what's happening with, the, with, with this. But, it, but basically, what we're trying to do, um, and I talked about the $1.3 billion that, are, that we invest in Canada, but it's out of $110 billion, billion uh, that we spend around the world. So rough math is we're spending about 1% of the, all the research dollars that we spend around the world in Canada. Yet we're a little below 3% of the market. There's no rule that we have to spend the exact same percentage, but it's the kind of target that we would, we would want to strive for. So do you imagine if we double our 1.3 billion to 2.6 billion, what we could be doing in terms of the healthcare system and credibility and reputation of our, of our, of our, uh, of our industry. Now, and this, is an, this is a slide in terms of the investments. And when you, when you talk about IP, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, is in the early, in the early 80s, we were investing about 93 million, and now we're well over a billion. You do see that it has gone down in the last few years, but so have sales when it comes to uh, innovative medicines. When you look at the PMPRB, in the last two years, innovative medicines have actually gone down by two and three percent. Generics have gone up, mostly be, be through utilization, but it is difficult when the actual revenues are going down to maintain the investment dollar. So one of the things we are trying to do here in Canada in 2012, and I voted uh, on yes, Helen, to 2012, because, because we're working very hard with the federal government to bring forward internationally harmonized intellectual property through the European trade agreements. It's a very comprehensive um, trade agreement, but there are three issues that are on the table that Europe is asking Canada to do. One is to give, give us an effective right of appeal. Generics in front of the courts, uh, if they lose, can appeal. If we lose in front of the courts, we can't appeal. So that's, that's a simple non-legal analysis. We're asking for uh, the fairness in front of the courts. The, the second issue that we're asking for is data protection. As you know, when you file for a license, you have to tell the government everything. Um, and there are huge volumes of information. Canada moved in 2006 to make uh, data protection eight years, which was quite a step forward. But unfortunately, um, it is not world class. Um, there are 12 years of data protection in the US for biologics, 10 years of data protection in Europe. So Europe is saying, Incre incre incrementally change the eight years to ten years. And then finally, we've talked to this conference before in terms of access. Health Canada tends to be slower uh, than a lot of other jurisdictions in regulatory approvals. So the notion of patent term restoration is that if there are clinical and regulatory delays, you get to add them to the end of the patent, therefore uh, restoring the patent, therefore the title patent term restoration. Canada, believe it or not, is, only, is, is one of three countries in the OACD without it. Mexico and New Zealand are the two others. So that's the package that we're trying to move forward so that our, global, that our Canadian CEOs can win the battles um, in terms of bringing in new investments. Those are crucial to, to IP, so I wanted to ask you, what do you think the results of the CETA negotiation will be? Will we get data protection? Will we get data protection on patent term restoration? What do you want? to get, or do you want to get all three, or do you want to get none? That's the question. Excellent. I do want to talk to the other 25% here, though. So, one more question on here. That's what you wanted. Um, what do you think the results will be? Hmm. All right. 
We have our work ahead of us. So thank you for that feedback. And let me tell you that our industry is very careful on that, is our position clearly is the only thing that's going to make Canada become world class is if we get all three. Less than all three will not set the, the industry up to win greater global contracts. And as time is running out, just very quickly, I wanted to share two other things. In, in just a couple of days, April, um, uh, Monday of next week, uh, our new code of industry uh, of ethical practice will come into, into play. There are, there, there, it's actually in, en vigueur, it's, it's in place right now. There's full training going on. The biggest change is not necessarily for, for, rep, for reps because most of that work has been done, but I guess the biggest change is now those principles expand to all employees that are directly or indirectly involved in our companies. If there's any questions about that later on because there's very little time. And then finally, I just wanted to tell, um, tell people a little bit of a hot subject that we're all dealing with, the drug shortages. Um, and it's the, you see a letterhead here that you don't often see as RX and D and C uh, and the generics, the CGPA um, together. But we, we reached out to the generics and said, look, there's a lot of work that's been going on in terms of drug shortages and people are looking for transparency and good information and timely information about what, what drugs um, are short. So we um, have committed to the government uh, significant funds that we can build one bilingual site that people can access where the shortages are. That's one sample page that it is, and you can get it um, get it through any of the websites. Um, we're quite we're quite excited about that. But but I want to be very clear. We were quite clear in parliamentary hearings yesterday. Better reporting is is a first important step. Transparency of information is an important step. But if we don't change the procurement strategies of this country to make sure that we move away in the post-patent um, uh, sector, we move away from sole source contracts in which winner takes all is, is been what, what's been driving governments. Um, if we don't change that, we are going to continue to have a situation that could be very difficult during a drug shortage uh, situation. What we are recommending is that you have to have a multiplicity or, or multi-source strategy so that if sometimes, for whatever reason, not with standing great efforts, there are drug shortages, we'll have other options uh, to, to rely on. I will stop there. It's difficult to do all this in, in 12 minutes. I hope I gave a quick overview, and I'll certainly be open to questions at the end of this session. Merci beaucoup, and I think I'm supposed to invite Peter, the President and CEO of Biotech Canada, to take the, take the podium now. Thank you.